Hi, good evening. I'm Terry Sheridan. I'm WSHU Senior Director of News and Education, and welcome everyone here on this conversation. This is Join the Conversation, and November is National Veterans and Military Month. And tonight we're going to shine a spotlight on women's health in the military, the barriers that our female service members face when and veterans when they're trying to access the health care that they need. And we'll also look to possible solutions. We'll hear from the boots on the ground who work with and for female veterans and military families. Now we do have closed captioning available. You can turn it on or off by selecting the closed caption or the live um, transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. Now you may see the need to click more first. If you don't see it, you can then choose to show subtitle or hide subtitle. If you want to know which panelists is speak in each section, select full view transcript. Your host this evening is WSHO's Desiree DiOrio. Now, as part of NPR's American Homefront Project, Desiree has been reporting on the lives of service members and their families in Connecticut, in New York, and throughout the country. As we discuss various aspects of women's health care, we may veer into territory that is controversial. So please understand that this is an evening and it's meant to be a forum for sharing information and for civil discourse. Everyone is welcome to share concerns and questions in a respectful manner, but we will not allow any outbursts or any Zoom bombing. And with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Desiree DiOrio. Good evening, Desiree. Thank you, Terry. And thanks to everybody joining us tonight. Recently, the focus has been on reproductive health care, and our guests are going to give us the lay of the land on abortion access in the military, but we're also going to explore mental health care and issues that impact military families, not just service members. We'll also take a look at a veterans health care program right here in our backyard. Uh, I want to introduce to you our panelist, Jenny Carrillo is a clinical psychologist who used to work at Planned Parenthood. Now she's the chief commercial officer at Ovia Health, a digital health company with a focus on women's health care. Also with us is Deshauna Barber. She's an Army veteran, and now she's the CEO and president of Service Women's Action Network. She's an advocate for women on Capitol Hill on issues like military sexual assault and access to health care. And we have Eileen Huck. She's in charge of government relations for the National Military Family Association advocating for quality of life issues for military families, especially the military health system and behavioral health. And finally, last but not least, we have Barbara Kieber. She's been a doctor for four decades. She's the vice chair of family medicine at Northwell Health, one of the largest health systems in New York. And she's been working on a special program to train doctors who treat veterans. We're excited to have all of you here, thank you. Uh, audience members, if you want to ask a question, please use your Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And with that, let's get right into it. Now, we invited Senator Kirsten Gillibrand of New York to join us. She was not able to join us in person, but she did send us a message. Gillibrand sits on the Armed Services Committee, and she's the chair of the Subcommittee on Personnel. Here's the Senator. Hello, everyone. I'm Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and I'm grateful to Desiree DiOrio and WSHU Public Radio for hosting this roundtable discussion on women's health in the military. I also want to thank our panelists for engaging in this discussion. Our nation's women's, women's service members and veterans are critical to our national security, bringing a unique set of skills and perspectives to our nation's armed services. But even as our women in uniform strengthen our nation's military, they are also facing a number of unique challenges and needs. From specific physical and mental health needs to challenges with sexual harassment and pregnancy, the difficulties that our female service members face both during their service and after must be acknowledged so that we can continue to have one of the greatest fighting forces in the world. For example, while many service members of both genders are suffering from their exposure to toxic burn pits, women service members can develop unique conditions and symptoms that are quite different than those experienced by their male colleagues. These include everything from ovarian and breast cancer to potentially even pregnancy loss and infertility. So as we work to expand access to necessary treatment for our service members exposed to toxic burn pits, we need to make sure that our women service members are not being left behind. 
We want to thank you all again for engaging in this important discussion. And I will keep fighting to provide our women's service members with the resources they need to reach their full potential and keep supporting our national defense. The burn pit legislation was obviously huge news when it passed this summer, uh, one of the largest expansions of health and disability benefits for veterans in a long time. The Senator also mentioned access to reproductive health care. Jenny, the landscape for women has changed drastically since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade this summer. And now with the midterm elections behind us, can you recap those recent events and and bring us up to speed on where we stand today? Um, importantly, um, what has the, been removed from women are the protection to have access to care and the freedom to choice across um, the country. And so now we are seeing um, um, significant disparities in the access that women have depend upon where they live. I think this is a particularly um, challenging issue for veterans, as we know, as and women in the military, because oftentimes they are living in states where the legislation are not um, accommodating to them and their needs. And so being able to move um, is not something that they are that is actually within their control. And so getting the access to the care that they need is very challenging for them, depending upon where they are living in the legislation that has been enacted in those states. Yeah. Um, Deshauna, everything that Jenny just laid out there, um, having to travel out of state, um, this has a unique effect on women in the military who are obviously stationed all over the world. Can you talk to us about that and about your work at the Service Women's Action Network? Sure. So SWAN is an organization that was founded in 2007 with the purpose of being a support organization that is dedicated to the needs of both service women and women veterans, regardless of rank, military branch, or years of service. SWAN focuses on preventing discrimination and providing service women with the resources they need to accomplish their goals. We have our primary four focuses, which is one, combat integration, reduce discrimination, bias, harassment, and assault, and reproductive health care for both active duty service women, reservists, and for women veterans. This impact is huge. Uh, the new RAND study paper came out a few months ago that estimated between 5,000 and 7,400 active duty service women and DOD employed civilian women have an abortion annually. Due to the Supreme Court's ruling in Dobbs versus Jackson, about 40% of those service women and DOD civilian women now have either no access or severely restricted access to abortion services where they live or are stationed. What this does is it increases more instances of duty restrictions, non-deployability for women experiencing unwanted pregnancies. Also not to mention that if in some cases of rape, you now have service women carrying the children of their rapists and the mental and emotional effects, and not to mention the effects on readiness in cases where the life of the mother is at risk. Because this is such a new shift, a lot of the impact data we want to be able to fully understand will take years to truly discover. So anecdotally, we can make a future determination that there will be a huge negative effect. Deshauna, where's the Defense Department on this? Uh, the DOD actually, surprisingly, uh, has made some, some pretty big changes. Uh, Secretary Austin's decision to issue a, mem a memo asserting policies that created protect protections for service women, women veterans in need of abortion. The memo, in short, improves the privacy and authorizes administrative leave versus medical leave and authorizes travel expenses for service women needing to leave the state. Also under federal law, abortion care in cases of rape and incest and life of the mother is now something that is offered on a military, military hospitals. So these are things that was actually issued by the DOD quite swiftly. We, um, we are very proud actually of Secretary Austin for his decision to do that and for the DOD backing him. And Deshauna, are you concerned about um, about privacy issues? I mean, you have to get permission for everything in the military, right? Yes. So because of the fact that now, now based on what Secretary Austin has issued, this leave request that will be presented to commanders looks like an administrative leave request versus a medical leave request. So that really does protect the privacy of the soldier. Um, Eileen, you're not only with the National Military Family Association, 
your husband is retired Navy. So you and him and your kids are a military family. Um, sometimes civilians don't understand what that military lifestyle is like. Can you talk a little bit about those realities and especially how that impacts things like family planning and access to contraception? Sure, Des, and thank you so much for having me and for including military families in this conversation. Um, I think what people don't realize is that military families move every two to three years and they typically don't have a whole lot of control over where or when they move. And so that means that not only these women service members, but also the, the female spouses of service members uh, can find themselves in these states where their reproductive health choices are severely restricted. Um, now they don't have to request leave necessarily to uh, travel out of state to obtain the reproductive health care that they need, but it does present a financial burden on the family. So as Deshana pointed out, uh, like Swan, we were very uh, encouraged to see the directives issued by Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin um, that included uh, travel allowances for both service members and dependents who have to travel uh, to different states to obtain uh, uh, necessary reproductive health care. So, uh, you know, and I, I would also like to point out that in addition to just a basic human right, uh, the ability to, to plan when and whether you want to have children is uh, a financial issue for many families and not being able to control your own, uh, the, the timing of how and when you build your family, um, you know, can, can place many families uh, in, in incredible financial and, and other kinds of stress. And so, you know, we, my organization, the National Military Family Association advocates uh, on a wide range of quality of life issues for service members and their families and, you know, al allowing families to have the, 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 the right and the ability to make their own uh, family building choices is critical, we think, to their quality of life. Um, Eileen, what would help here? Congress has, Congress doesn't have a choice. They have to pass the annual defense spending bill before the end of the year. Can anything be done there to, to help with any of these issues? So that's a great question. Um, you know, there's obviously a lot in the defense authorization focused on military family quality of life issues. Uh, I think the the issue of reproductive health care has become, uh, you know, obviously it's a very controversial and contentious issue. We're pleased that there's language in the bill that addresses uh, contraceptive access. Uh, right now there's a disparity uh, for people who use TRICARE, which is the military health system. Um, they have to pay co-pays if they uh, obtain their contraceptives out in the civilian uh, pharmacy network. And so there's language that would address that, that would reduce the cost of uh, contraceptives. And, and we're pleased about that. Um, but, you know, we're, I am, I, I'm not sure that Congress is really acting at this point to uh, secure reproductive freedom for military spouses. Again, it's a really controversial and contentious issue. Um, Jenny, if I can ask you a question about something that Deshauna was saying about privacy, um, is that something that digital health platforms like Ovia could help with to keep that kind of information, um, contraceptive use, um, you know, all, all of those femtech things that that we've been hearing about? Is that something that that a platform like Ovia could help with in terms of maintaining that level of privacy? There is a high level of security on those. They are all. Um, uh, Ovia itself, as many others are, um, abide, abide by HIPAA security as well as high trust to ensure the safety of those that data. So in, indeed, it does keep them safe. I think um, the larger issue, though, is um, certainly we need to be thinking about the safety of the data, but then also um, it's, you know, being mindful of the people who are actually also supporting um, the the woman and making sure that they have a broader access to care. So it goes beyond the digital platform, right? And so it's that's where some of the data is secure, but then you need to get, direct them to providers who are actually able to 
um, provide the, the holistic care that is needed. And so I think ensuring that you are using a platform that not only has data, but also can direct you to providers um, that are able to support you or provide you with information. So you're equipped with the knowledge to um, make decisions that are appropriate for you is really, really important um, at a moment like this. So many of these health issues, um, they, they overlap with one another. And, and one, I've noticed one overlapping healthcare issue is mental health. Um, we know from the Defense Department itself that there's a lack of qualified mental health care providers within the military health system. Um, Deshauna, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between military sexual trauma and PTSD and, and that need for mental health that's accessible, especially for women? Well, military sexual trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder are all one and the same when it comes to some women that have, you know, experienced sexual assault or have been raped or have experienced sexual harassment during their service. It is something that is going to be an issue until it's not an issue. And it's, it's very difficult to be able to decide when that happens. Um, I think that what would probably drive this prevention piece of it is to make sure that we are holding those accountable that have uh, committed you know, sexual acts uh, against other people that are not looking for that, they're not interested in that, that are being pushed against their will to do things that they're not interested in doing, that are predators um, that are within the military. It starts there. You know, when we're talking about military sexual trauma, this is, this is the after effects of something that a person has experienced during their service. So it is very difficult to look both ways in my mind. I'm always looking as an organization for SWAN to be able to look for preventative methods so that service women don't even have to get to the point where we're trying to have military uh, sexual trauma as a thing that we're trying to give therapy for, that we're looking for holistic uh, resources for service women. A lot of these issues are difficult and almost hard to repair. So although I don't know the, the back end of how an organization can fully be able to provide that a repaired system, I think that it's important for organizations and for the DOD and for the military to focus on how to make sure people are not only getting the justice that they deserve, but to make sure that when a person commits an act of sexual assault or sexual harassment, they are immediately moved, removed from the military themselves because oftentimes these are repeat offenders. They've not done it once, they've done it twice, three times or four times. So making sure that these people are removed from the ranks immediately is one of the better ways for us to be able to protect women and those that are victims. Um, Eileen, also something that the National Military Family Association has been working on has been increased access to mental health care, not only for service members, but also for dependent spouses and dependent kids. And we know, and it's just a numbers thing, there's, there's no way around it. Most military service members are male, right? So when we're talking about um, dependent spouses, we're usually talking about women. Can you talk a little bit about, about being able to expand that mental health care treatment, not just for uh, female service members, but also for, for dependent spouses and kids? Sure, absolutely. It's such an important issue and it's a huge priority for my organization. You made an excellent point earlier that we know that the supply of mental health care within the Department of Defense uh, is is nowhere near what the demand is. In fact, there was the Department of Defense uh, Inspector General report back in 2020 that that revealed that neither within the military treatment facilities nor within the civilian healthcare network uh, were, were they able to meet access to care standards. So we know that this is a huge problem. Um, you know, the demand for mental health care among families has skyrocketed in, in recent years. This is something that reflects national trends. We know that uh, particularly among uh, children and teens, uh, the past few years have been a, a huge uh, stress, uh, a huge stress for them in terms of their mental health. And there's been a huge uh, corresponding demand for mental health care. Um, you know, we are really encouraged that both the Department of Defense and Congress have recognized that there's an inadequate supply of mental and behavioral health care within the Department of Defense system and are taking steps to address that. 
Uh, just within this year's defense authorization, the, the annual bill authorizing expenditures for the military, there are really interesting and innovative provisions that would uh, expand the pool of mental and behavioral health care providers within the Department of Defense. There's language that would increase the number of uh, mental and behavioral health care providers that can be trained at uh, the Department of Defense Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. There's other provisions that would uh, create scholarships for individuals who want to pursue careers as licensed clinical social workers or clinicians or psychologists, and then you know, agree to commit to a certain number of years working within the Department of Defense. So we think these kind of you know, grow your own provisions are really the best way to address this longstanding issue of a lack of mental health care within the Department of Defense. And we're really pleased that Congress is, is taking these steps to, uh, you know, to, to bring these programs to life. And we're very hopeful. Uh, you know, the, the defense authorization for this year hasn't passed yet. Um, I wish Senator Gillibrand were here because I'd love to ask her about it. Um, but we're hopeful that these provisions will be passed when, um, you know, when Congress reconvenes and, and moves on the defense authorization. And we think these, these provisions could make a big difference. And Eileen, just so I'm clear, those expansions in, in the bill, those would not only cover service members themselves, but also family members? Uh, they would. Um, although I will say the majority of behavioral health care that happens within the military treatment facilities uh, is geared towards service members, but by expanding the pool of providers, uh, we both expand the, the 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 amount of care available for service members, but also for spouses and and military family members who seek care within the military health system. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Barbara to talk about her work in a second, but before I do that, I just want to remind our audience: if you do want to submit a question, um, please use that Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, appreciate that, um, Barbara. You treat veterans and their family members at Northwell Health, and you've been developing these training modules so that other doctors can provide better health care to them. Tell us about that. What are you teaching them, and, and what is this training program like? Right. So the, the training modules are uh, have been developed outside of Northwell, um, but we went through a process of looking for uh, training and education uh, products that we could use to teach our family medicine uh, providers, um, our, our family medicine physicians, uh, both residents uh, in training, are in training physicians. These are new physicians coming out of training, um, as well as our uh, current attending uh, physicians in order to really um, educate them around um, the treatment of veterans specifically. So the modules uh, contain a lot of information, a lot of really great information about some of the things that we've already been talking about this evening. And it includes things like uh, women's health care um, and, and uh, family physicians provide a lot of uh, women's health care uh, to um, our community members. But many of our veterans or, or, or their families are uh, members in our own community. And only about two to three percent of physicians are really adequately trained to, in fact, provide appropriate care for veterans, particularly those who've uh, had particular um, uh, uh, issues around PTSD and some of the mental health things that, that we've been discussing here, as well as some of the issues around women's health. And so what these modules do is they actually address each of those issues uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular module and um, really give very good information as to how to talk to the veterans about these issues. How do you bring up, you know, it's pretty difficult to bring up um, uh, military sexual trauma. Um, it, it, it's not something you just say, well, have you had military sexual trauma? There, there, there's a way to discuss that. And the modules are excellent because they really give us the tools to actually talk to veterans 
to get the history, which is sometimes very difficult for uh, uh, members or family members to actually talk about. And so that the, the tools to, to do those things and then to provide the appropriate care, whether we can provide the care itself uh, within our, our, our own practices or whether it's a referral to a behavioral health specialist that might, uh, again, be a, a part of our network. Um, we have a network uh, within Northwell um, where um, we can access people who um, have been trained to uh, really work with our, our veterans to provide appropriate health care, especially around the things uh, uh, that, that we've mentioned, but not just the behavioral health, it's, it's even the other, the other issues. And then another piece of the puzzle there is really related to um, the families. We talked about the family members and those family members may be caregivers for veterans who have either PTSD or other um, issues, medical issues, disabilities, uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries, um, uh, amputations, various things like that. And those caregivers need assistance as well. And many of the, as you mentioned earlier, many of those caregivers are the women, um, uh, their spouses or, or uh, mothers of, of young veterans um, who come back from, uh, from uh, a, a deployment uh, with uh, some of these issues. And it's really, really important for us to be able to help the caregivers to support them, um, you know, from a psychological perspective, but also to help them to advocate for their veteran uh, to obtain the kind of care that they, that they deserve. You started to get into it there, but those kinds of health conditions, traumatic brain injuries, PTSD, are, are those the types of conditions that make it different treating civilians versus Veterans, like what are those, how is it different treating a civilian versus, uh, a, how is it different to treat a female civilian versus a female veteran? Like what are those things that you're looking for? Right, so I think the, the, the issues there are oftentimes around the actual experiences. The, um, the female who's um, a, a spouse or a caregiver um, has not actually experienced those, those traumas, but they certainly experience it secondarily through the veteran. And the veterans themselves, so female veterans um, who've experienced those traumas really are, are in, a, in a very different place in terms of the way that they respond um, it, because of the actual trauma that they've been through, whether that's a military sexual trauma or whether it's just, again, a traumatic brain injury. And we, we see women with traumatic brain injuries in the uh, you know, in the in the in the regular civilian population, but the kinds of things that are in their background are very different than than those um, uh, who've received traumatic brain injuries or other uh, insults. Uh, you know, uh, through the through the um, military. Okay. Um, last question I'll ask you, Barbara, before I get to some of the questions from our audience members. Um, in, in a perfect world, in a perfect healthcare world, what would you like to see a veteran or, um, or maybe a caregiver, what would you like to see them um, do to better advocate for themselves when they're sitting in the doctor's office? What, what can they do? Right. So I think that being open and honest with the physician that they're sitting in front of and letting them know what is it that we can help you with? Because if you don't, you know, it's very difficult for, you know, physician sitting in the office to say, well, I, I you know, I, we need to know what it is that they need. Now, sometimes they don't exactly know what they need. So it's really talking. And for on the part of the physician, it's really about listening to the concerns of the veteran and or the caregiver and really hearing what they have to say. And I think that's true of every you know, uh, patient physician relationship, but I think it's even more true um, in the case of, of the veteran because, you know, they've experienced a lot of things that perhaps, uh, you know, I myself, I'm not a veteran. So they've experienced things that, that uh, you know, I, I've read about, I can be trained to understand about them, but I haven't experienced them. So we need to hear the stories of the veterans and of those veterans caregivers in order to be able to advocate for the appropriate care for them, whether it be 
uh, a, a, a rehabilitation uh, facility for somebody who's got traumatic brain injury, whether it be uh, related to uh, a military sexual trauma and, and behavioral health issues around that, or regardless of what it is, again, we need to hear their stories. And so don't be afraid. You know, I, I would say to the vets and, and their caregivers out there, don't be afraid to tell the physician what, what it is that, 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 you know, is really um, going on uh, with you um, and, and, you know, try to develop a trust with, with your physician. Um, we can be uh, a very good ally for, for, the, for the vet and for the uh, caregivers uh, and their families and, and, and their, uh, their kids and their, their spouses. And uh, I think that, you know, we, we can direct them uh, to the appropriate resources. And, and I think that that's something that we have to offer them. Um, and it is different um, again, the relationships. I think it's more difficult for the vets and their families to do this because, as mentioned earlier, um, Eileen was mentioning that you know they move every two to three years. So this is not a group of individuals who's been having a family physician for 30 years. Um, this is somebody who's got to develop a new relationship every time they they change spots or they or or once they've retired um, to develop a relationship with a, with a physician in their local area. And so I think that's really the important piece um, that they would. Um, you know, really need to, um, to uh, be, um, you know, hopefully to build a trust with the physician. Um, all right, let's go to some of the questions that have been coming in. And again, audience members, um, feel free to throw your question in, um, use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're going to go to a question from Gabby, who uses a lot of, um, acronyms that I'm going to do my best with folks. Um, Deshauna might need, Deshauna and Eileen might need your help on this. Um, Gabby wants to know what kinds of training or provisions are being included around PMADs, which I think is a, a health document, PMADs. As a service member that experienced PPA and PPTSD, which I believe is postpartum anxiety and postpartum uh, stress disorder, there was a huge lack of understanding in PMADs. Through my work in advocacy, I found that most people felt the same way. Now, as a disabled veteran in the VA system, I find the same thing. Um, Deshauna, let me um, put that to you, I think. Sorry, I'm trying to make out these are, these are acronyms I'm trying to also put together too. What training slash provisions are being included around prenatal mood and anxiety disorders. So oh, I thought that was a health document in uh, within the military. Okay, maybe that's a better question for Barbara then. When yeah. we talk about um, postpartum and um, other issues like a postpartum uh, stress disorder, um, is there any kind of specialized training that doctors get specifically as it relates to the veteran or, or active duty experience with that? So some of that information is in the modules that I spoke about before. Um, although, again, I, I, I feel that that uh, the person asked Gabby that's asked this question is probably correct in the fact that there are not there is not enough training around this. And this is a point that also. Um, I think uh, brings in some of the inequities in, in healthcare um, a, a, across the board when we talk about maternal um, morbidity and mortality. Um, and that's something that I think is true across the board, whether it, it's uh, veterans or whether it's um, you know the civilian population. And I don't think that any of us, we're, we're working very diligently to improve the training around this. Um, I know that um, there's been a big task force among multiple disciplines, um, ACOG, which is the um, uh, association, uh, the, uh, the American College of uh, OBGYN, um, the American Academy of Family Physicians, um, and, and several other organizations are really working very hard 
to um, improve the kinds of care that we can provide for individuals with these kinds of issues. This is a huge problem. It's a huge problem even in the civilian population. It, it, it's, it's, again, it carries over into the veterans population as well. Um, but it, it, we're, we're definitely not doing enough here. Um, again, um, you know, one of the things that we're working on is is to develop a, 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 um, a, a to get a grant to really enhance some of the training that we're able to do, and we're working um, uh, uh, to try to get a Hearst grant, um, which is a, a you know a fair amount of of, of dollars, uh, in order to really be able to expand this education that we're doing around uh, the veterans care. And and again, this is one of the areas where we definitely are lacking. Um, and I I, I mean it, it, again it's it's really about starting from the residents going all the way up through the attending physicians to train everyone around these issues. It's definitely a, a problem. There's no question that we don't have enough uh, providers and, and, and that are able to really deal um, adequately with these issues. Eileen, can you jump in here? Because I know that um, obstetric and gynecological care is one of the largest things that the military health system does, right? Um, is there a, a, anything else you can add on that about what, what can be done about these postpartum issues within either the VA or within the military health system? Yeah, I'm so glad that this question was asked because I think that's something that people probably don't realize about the military health system is that whether you're talking about women's service members or spouses, these are young families, uh, their, their time in life where they're building their families. And uh, you know, deliveries are probably the most common procedures that take place at most military hospitals. And I think most of us in the civilian world wouldn't realize that. But there are definitely elements of the military lifestyle that can exacerbate the, the stress and anxiety that, you know, can often accompany the postpartum period. It's, it was alluded to earlier, military families move frequently. So a new mom, whether she's a service member or a military spouse, isn't likely to have a, a network of family or friends around when she delivers. It's very likely that her, her partner could be deployed. Again, whether it's a, a service member or a spouse, it's, it's not at all uncommon for uh, a, a mom to deliver when that service member or her partner is deployed. And so, you know, these are all stressors that are, um, you know, common to military life, but they, they really add to the, the stress and anxiety surrounding, uh, you know, that, that immediate postpartum period and can contribute to uh, anxiety and depression. And so, we were really pleased actually in last year's defense authorization, uh, there was legislation passed to, uh, to pilot a program for doula care uh, to, to be there with new military moms uh, before, during, and in the immediate aftermath of labor and delivery to provide some of that support. And, you know, again, it's not a perfect solution. It's, it's not going to be there for everybody, but it's a recognition that there are elements of the military life that, you know, that um, that can add a stress and there are steps that can be taken to try and alleviate that. Um, I never thought about that before, that because of deployments and because of the frequent moves, women could be delivering a baby and not know anybody around that would help out. Um, so uh, let me get to our next question. It comes from Joan. Um, there's been a greater awareness and acceptance of mental health issues within the general public during the past few years. Has the military implemented any changes to remove this stigma for those seeking help with general mental health issues? Short answer, and I'll ask Deshauna on this. Short answer, the military has tried to implement changes to remove the stigma on mental health, whether it's successful. Uh, I'm not clear, but Deshauna, what do you think? Hmm. So I, I just got out in June after serving 11 years, and um, I will say that the military has done a few things to be able to, to implement. They've had, you know, unit advocates that you can go to. They've had behavioral health specialists. They've given you a little bit more access to those people, but the, the problem is not necessarily the programs that they're implementing. It's whether or not a person within the unit or um, 
it's, it's, it's whether or not the unit is judging you when they see you walking into these buildings. And I think that there's actually a cultural issue that can be difficult to, to, uh, to, to break apart and to end that stigma. So I think it's always great when they're able to have unit meetups, they're able to have unit roundtable talks to be able to talk about soldiers within the unit that are actually experiencing mental health issues or have overcome those mental health issues. I have seen that the military has requirements for certain units uh, annually to be able to put together those roundtable discussions. And I think that helps break down the stigma because you're able to have those direct discussions with soldiers to your left and your right with your battle buddies. Uh, but in terms of the uh, military as a whole, I think that it starts at the unit level. And as long as the military continues to implement and break the stigma from the very base, I think that it helps trickle up. Because you have that 11 years of experience in did you ha did you personally notice any changes from like when you first got there to when you retired? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. There's certain things that you wouldn't even talk about uh, uh, years ago. There are certain conversations you would never talk about. Uh, but now I've noticed that a lot of these units that I've even had chances to work with in units that I've been in myself, we've had a lot of those open conversations in that dialogue. So I do see those changes happening. I see that uh, a lot of things have have shifted throughout the years that I've been in. I, I joined at 17 and I just got out. <laughs> um, and we're, we're talking about RLTC all the way up until um, this past June. So even if we count RLTC, we're, we're looking at about 15 years. But um, I, I also come from a military family. My father, mother, sister, and brother are all Army veterans. And we're talking about even thinking about my father's time period when he joined back wow. in the early 80s. We're talking about a time period in which you absolutely would not be caught walking into a behavioral health building to be able to talk about yourself uh, having suicidal thoughts. So I do think that culturally we have changed, but there's still some way to go. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from JD. His question is, what's the role of telehealth and connecting our aging veteran population with the technology they need to participate? And I'm going to, I'm going to put this to Jenny. With, with the tech that is available today, which is, you know, <laughs> so much different than it was 30, 40, 50 years ago, can older veterans, do you think, access the kind of technology that a company like Ovia offers? Certainly. So there's a lot of different um, digital health platforms, um, particularly in telehealth, different than um, Ovia. Um, the platforms actually are very user friendly. It's interesting. Back when I was um, focused specifically on telehealth, we oftentimes encountered people who were saying people are going to have difficulty using this. And what we actually found was as people, the generation that people thought were not going to be able to be functional users of um, telehealth, they were actually quite able to use it. You know what I think on expectedly people were not aware how much time people who were retired close to retirement were actually spending on their phone talking to grandkids say for example and so they were actually becoming more familiar with technology you know we, we always used to joke that they actually spent more time on their devices than we did who were working people because we were busy and our other meetings and so didn't have that same kind of ability to sit there and you know um use our devices. Post though COVID, um, we saw a very rapid increase and in escalation in the use of telehealth. And so everyone has now been using telehealth. And so um, I do think that is um, the barriers that um, what the concern that's being mentioned actually is one that has largely been removed at this point um, because people are so familiar with technology. I'll say one, one other thing, just kind of adding to some of the other conversations here. I think, um, you know, as a clinical psychologist, one of the things that we are um, so present to is, is the stigma, right? And just recognizing that the stigma is something that really is actually one of the biggest barriers. So, you know, um, while the technology is a barrier, the stigma is something that is one aspect of it. And then I also think, you know, Barbara, you were alluding to something that I think is another challenge is that we, um, as individuals, oftentimes expect people to come in and advocate for themselves. And yet, oftentimes people who have some kind of mood disorder are very unaware that they are actually experiencing some kind of psychological disorder and distress. And so 
they they don't know how to advocate for themselves and it is it does require um the the curiosity of those around them and the curiosity of the providers to actually help them identify it um and i think that that's you know particularly important as we're talking about women during covid when um a survey was done they actually found that women were three percent or three times more likely than men to experience uh, mood disorders and so all these psychological disorders are, exist out there and yet oftentimes they're going undiagnosed. And so it really requires us to think about how do we actually proactively do that identification? And that's one of the biggest challenges. I, I, our software is one of those that actually does that. It's um, quite good about doing the predictive analytics, but there's so many other ways that we need to be doing that. It's not just about digital technology to enable it. It is about the network and the family. It is about the support system. And then in the military to the points that have been ma being made, when you're in a community where you don't know anybody necessarily, people don't recognize that your behavior is perhaps changed in some way, there's a certain kind of responsibility in the community to actually um, address people with a different kind of curiosity to help um, identify those things that might actually be um, going unrecognized. That leads me to this next question, which I think is great. This comes from Rima. Is there anything that civilians can do to help to make sure that women service members and, and female veterans can access the health care that they need. So bridging that civilian military divide, right? Is there anything that civilians or or civilian caregivers um, can do to make sure that that the health care is there? I think that's absolutely critical, right? And I think it is um, coming from that awareness and making sure that people are thinking about this in a much um, more comprehensive way that we're looking for those signals um, and actually engaging in the in the conversations. What I what I am excited about is that we are seeing the stigma. Is um, you know we see we're seeing a reduction in the stigma to the point that Sean was making, and I think that that's really important that we know the conversation is occurring now. And so. Uh, one of the ways that we can actually do that also is by opening up ourselves and and talking a little bit more frankly and honestly about the things, our own struggles, because what we find is that's actually one of the most connecting way to actually help engage others in those conversations. And so as we start talking more openly about our own struggles, we also are finding it easier for other people to engage in those conversations as well and being um, willing to kind of share a little bit more. And then we're able to identify those people who potentially are at risk in a way that we've not been able to do. Um, this next question, um, Eileen, if you can jump in here, is are there any, and, and Barbara too, if you know, um, are there any resources for caregivers specifically on how they can get support dealing with a, um, with a, a veteran or an active duty family member that's, that's getting health care? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because it was alluded to earlier. It's a huge issue. There's a huge population of spouse and parent caregivers who are taking care of wounded, ill, and injured vets. Uh, there are some wonderful organizations that are dedicated to providing support and resources to um, caregivers. Uh, I would direct anybody to the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, uh, which was stood up uh, about 10 years ago uh, by Senator Elizabeth Dole uh, when after she encountered uh, wounded service members and their caregiver families at Walter Reed when she was there caring for her own husband. And they have a, a wide array of uh, services and supports and resources for caregiver families. Even within the VA, um, there are uh, there is a, a program to provide a stipend and support for uh, caregivers. Uh, there, there are certain uh, criteria that need to be met uh, to participate in that program, but if, if you do qualify, there is a stipend and respite care and, and support and resources that are available. But the mental health of our caregivers is so critical. Um, it's, it's such an all-consuming job. It, you know, it, 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 when you are caring for a wounded, ill, or injured loved one, it, you know, it's it's twenty four seven. It can be very difficult to, uh, you know, work outside the home. Um, it's just it's it's hugely draining and demanding. And so, ensuring that those families have uh, support and services, and and especially respite care, uh, so that they can get the, the relief and the break they need, 
um, it's it's critically important. They're performing a, a vitally important service for this country and for our veterans, and it's it's important that we support them. Um, this next question, Eileen, I think I also want you to jump in here. This question is from Shariah. She's an Air Force vet who served from 2002 to 2006, quickly realized the gap in quality of treatment and access to services between male veterans and female veterans, even things like shuttles to housing services. It sometimes seems like female veterans are an afterthought. Are there any programs addressing this? Eileen, is that something that you guys are working on? So I would really defer to Deshana on this because I think that's probably her area of expertise, but I do know that it's it's so difficult to for so many women veterans who don't feel that they are uh, included in whatever our, our collective image is of a veteran. Um, and I know that steps have been taken within uh, the VA to broaden the services that are available to women veterans. Um, certainly within the Department of Defense, there's a recognition that you need to try to recruit and retain women service members because you just can't have, a, you know, the all volunteer force that you need without uh, recruiting and retaining women. Um, but I think there's been uh, mixed success in that regard. But I'd be really interested in hearing Deshauna's thoughts on that. Yeah, Deshauna, I mean, again, it. I know I said this before, but some, sometimes things simply come down to the numbers. And the reality on the ground is that there's far more male service members than female, which means there's going to be far more male veterans than female veterans. But but what are you guys seeing? Yes, it's one of the reasons why Service Women's Action Network was founded back in 2007 is because of that gap between services. It was even worse back then where, you know, now we're at maybe 17, 18% of the force. We're heading towards 30% in the Air Force. So it really is branch dependent in terms of um, what, how much we represent in terms of population. But I, I want to, and I'm looking at our resource portal right now because I really want to revert you all specifically uh, to our resource portal. If you go to servicewomen.org and you go to resources, you can see a list of almost thousands of resources that we have put within this resource portal. And a lot of it is state dependent. So it's very difficult for me to tell um, this Sharia what what organizations specifically handle this because a lot of our resource portal and a lot of resources are state dependent versus being uh, national organizations that provide something in every state. So I would refer you to our resource portal to be able to look and see uh, what specific thing you're looking for. It is unfortunate because a lot of these organizations are grassroots organizations that are founded within a specific state. So it really does depend, um, but also refer to the VA within that's local to you. But if it is something that you're looking for that may be a nonprofit or that's non-DOD related, go to our resource portal and check out a few things. Uh, one of the main ones that I see is called Lady Veterans Connect. They have kind of a one-stop shop as well option, uh, depending on what you're looking for, whether it comes to homelessness, whether whether it comes to direct services, if you're looking for a stipend, uh, whatever the case may be, go there um, and you'll be able to find some details there. But it's, it's difficult because I have to know what state you're in and then I'll be able to tell you what organization to kind of lean on. It's very hard to find an organization that nationally provides direct services for women veterans. And I'm, I'm sorry about that. We're trying, our, we're trying to grow ourselves to be able to do that, but it is super difficult. Um. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. We stuck that um, that link you mentioned in the chat. Um, okay, I, I we're gonna wrap up now, but before we leave, I want to invite each of you um, just to give me your final thought on this quickly. Um, if there's anything else important on women's health and the military that we didn't already cover that you think is important, anything like that. And first, um, Deshauna, uh, I'll I'll defer to you. Final closing thought. So final closing thought. Uh, our organization is is doing everything that we can in terms of prevention. We are we are doing everything that we can to make sure that we allow women to walk into the military and walk out as whole women, women that are um, that are moving themselves up the rank in and out, women that 
feel as though they really, really, really had a great experience during their service. The goal as an organization is to make sure that service women feel 110% as though they enjoyed their service. And our goal is to make sure that we push that. I would refer you all to servicewomensactionnetwork.com. And also we are coming out with an app called For Service Women next month. It is something that will have a hotline that will provide 24 seven uh, direct services for women that are interested in speaking to a case manager about whatever issue they're experiencing, whether it's homelessness, discrimination, uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment. We want service women to feel as though their experience was 100% amazing. And I know that that's difficult, especially after my experience for 11 years in the military. And we're looking to be able to make those changes and make that impact from a preventive life level. Thank you so much. That's great about the app. That's great. Um, Jenny, um, your final thought before we head out. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we haven't been able to touch on is actually the intersection of race and women in the military. And that's such a critical issue, as we know that um, racial ethnic health disparities are quite significant. Um, and in order to really achieve health equity, we really need to put some focus energy there. Um, importantly, we know that um, women of color are disproportionately represented in, in um, the military, much higher representation there, which is great. And though um, I think what but um, we also know is there that is also where we um, need to really put some focus energy if we want to address the mental health issues that exist um, and are disproportionately affect women of color. Um, also, in terms of maternal health, the outcomes there are significantly worse. Um, Black women are three to four more three to four times more likely to die in childbirth. This is a significant issue that needs to be addressed. Latinx women, fifteen. Um, percent more likely to develop gestational diabetes, 16% more likely to develop um, preeclampsia, 21% more likely to have hypertensive disorders. So there are issues that are that also are really lie on this um, intersection of race and gender and are de definitely represented in, high, in higher number in higher um, numbers than you might see in the civilian um, world because of the higher representation of women of color in the military. So a, co a conversation for another day. Excellent point, Jenny. We'll, we'll do this again and we will talk about that. Um, Barbara, um, any, any final thought here before we close out? So I, I, I echo what Jenny said. I think that, you know, this is a clear uh, uh, place for us to really make some, some impact um, in terms of the equity. Um, that's true in the civilian population as well. However, as you say, Jenny, the military population uh, is definitely um, a larger uh, percentage uh, than the general population in terms of uh, women of color. And um, it, it is uh, all of the things that uh, women experience experience um, in the military um, are more uh, disproportionately affected uh, in, in the women of color. Um, and so that, that establishing that equity, and again, I think the biggest thing from our perspective is we really need to train our physicians, family physicians, because we really br broaden the, 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 the uh, uh, gap from, uh, you know, taking care of women who are, are pregnant or, or, or um, uh, seeking, uh, you know, uh, birth control, uh, contraceptive uh, ad, uh, advice, et cetera, um, to all the way to uh, working with women uh, uh, with mental health issues um, from uh, whatever uh, the source. And so um, really educating our physicians, um, family docs, especially in the lay public to help our veteran women and again, the caregivers of veterans uh, to really be able to uh, do for them uh, what, what, you know, and, and really provide the services that they require and deserve. Which is really important here on Long Island, where we have such a, a large yep. population of, of veteran communities. Yeah. Um, Eileen, um, any final thought here before we leave? Well, again, I really want to thank you for including families in this conversation. I think it's impossible to have a conversation about women's health in the military without talking about uh, spouses and, and dependent kids. And so I'm really grateful that you included us in the conversation. And just to build on what Barbara said, you know, I, I think there's sometimes a, a misperception. Uh, people think that 
military families live on bases and they only go to military hospitals and they only go to school on base. And it's not true. There are military families uh, living in your civilian communities. They're your neighbors, they're your friends, they're your children's classmates. Um, if you're a civilian doctor, chances are, you know, you might be treating uh, a, a, a military family. And so to, to raise awareness of the, the presence of military families in our communities and raise awareness uh, among clinicians and other care providers of the challenges they face is so important to just ensuring that military families can be uh, resilient and, and thrive and do the important work that they need to do. So thank you for this conversation. Huge thank you to you, Eileen Huck, and Deshauna Barber, and Jenny Carrillo, and Barbara Kieber. Really appreciate all of you um, coming here and sharing your expertise with us. We appreciate it. Um, and now I will ask WSHU's general manager, Rima Dial, um, to, to close us out here, Rima. I am so awed <laughs> and full of gratitude for each of the amazing women on our panel. WSHU works really hard to center not only women's voices, but historically marginalized communities and raise awareness with issues that many of us um, civilians are not aware of. So thank you to each of you um, on this panel. And a thank you also to Sacred Heart University and the Connecticut National Guard for your support to bringing this forward. But a most important thank you to the American Homefront and all the work that um, Desiree Diario has done to bring us all together this evening. Thank you very much to our online community. And if you want to hear more information or stories like this, please check us out on our website at WSHU.org, or you can also download the WSHU app, which provides news and classical music. Thank you all uh, for attending this event this evening, and we appreciate your support and your patronage. Have a wonderful evening, everybody.